Hi, everyone. I'm here today with Stephen Salter, who is a professor emeritus of engineering design at Edinburgh University, and uh, Paul Beckwith, a climatologist, and Peter Wadhams, a professor emeritus of ocean physics at Cambridge University. And we're going to discuss today um, the very exciting possibilities behind um, marine cloud brightening. Stephen, you're the brains behind this operation. Can you uh, let us know what that is? The real people who are the brains is Sean Toomey, uh, who was able to fly over clouds and measure the amount of sunshine coming down from above and the amount of energy that was reflected back up from the cloud. Uh, and so he could measure the, re the reflectivity uh, of clouds. He could also fly into the cloud and collect samples of the drops in the, the cloud and their sizes and the concentrations of them. And this was done in the 1970s and it's fairly robust. And the main conclusion from his work is that the reflectivity depends on the size distribution of the drops uh, and a large number of small drops will reflect more light than a smaller number uh, of larger ones, but the same amount of liquid water. And the next step is a chap called John Latham, who knew about Toomey, and he wondered if you could uh, increase the reflectivity of clouds by increasing the number of condensation nuclei which are needed to grow a new cloud drop. What I've been looking at is, is the process of wave breaking, uh, the, the normal beautiful swoop and dive which actually pushes under the water a lot of air which then rises to the surface again as bubbles and that's the white stuff that we see when waves break and each one of those bubbles ejects hundreds or thousands of little droplets which happen to be about the size that we need for our experiments. So we have to find a way of generating uh, seawater droplets of the same size but in much greater quantities. You can't just have a new cloud drop because the relative humidity is over 100%. You also have to have a tiny little seed, a fragment of something, to get it started. And he knew that the salt residues from seawater would be very good condensation nuclei, and he knew how much how big they have to be, and so on. And he was amazed at how little water you'd need to spray to cancel all the uh, warming since pre-industrial times. And it worked out about 10 cubic meters a second if you could do it in the right places at the right times. Uh, the reflect also depends on how much the sunshine is going to be and uh, the initial concentrations of nuclei and so on. And I've been working on a project to try and make the sea evaporate more quickly by spraying water through the, the top surface. Uh, and he heard about this and he phoned me up and said, could I make the spray for his project? And I said, um, Yes, of course, I can leave that. No problem. Uh, this turned out to be a little bit inaccurate, but I'm nearly there. It is much, much harder than I thought to get to the size that he wants. Uh, but I think we're, we're very close to it. And uh, so really, the, 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 the key ideas are from Sean to me and, and John Latham. I'm just doing the hardware to make it, make it work. Uh, Peter, you've been working on this as well. Uh, how, how many of how much money would be needed and, and how extensive uh, is the effect of, of marine cloud brightening in terms of um, the climate? Well, as as a technique, um, it could be one of the, the most important techniques that we, we have for arresting global warming. I mean, we, the, we know that the, the ultimate way is to get rid of the CO2 from the atmosphere, but we also know how expensive that is going to be. We, we know better now when, when the early days when people thought, oh, let's take it out of the air with direct air capture, will be easy, won't it? It, it turns out that's in, in fact incredibly expensive and difficult. Um, but uh, marine cloud brightening can apply a sticking plaster to global warming. It, it's not going to get rid of the extra CO2 um, it's it's not going to to um, 
de-acidify the ocean or anything like that, but it is going to slow or stop global warming um, for, for however long we want to apply it. So the cost is, is, uh, is actually low compared to what can be accomplished. Uh, Stephen knows what the cost is. I can't give you a number, but, but I think he would agree that the cost of doing this on a large scale is going to be less than the cost of doing um, uh, direct air capture on a large scale. It's a, yeah. it's a cheap, cheapo sticking plaster for global warming. So it's very important we should pursue it, which is why it's it's significantly ghastly that the British government isn't pursuing it. So it's not going to take CO2 out of the air, to be clear, but it is going to keep the temperature which is the critical element in, in our climate crisis uh, to hopefully the, the 1.2 we already have or the 1.5 we're heading toward. Well, this has often been said, but during the war, um, the United States and the UK were able to shift all their industries to wartime. And now we are in the fight for our very survival. Uh, we could certainly shift our money and our industries instead of the military. <laughs> budgets of the world, which are enormous, um, you know, we need to start lowering the temperature of our planet, which is the critical element. Um, Paul, you've been very quiet. Um, how are you? Can you speak about this? Yes, yes. So a couple um, key points of, of marine cloud brightening. And uh, I'm like, like Peter and Stephen, I'm extremely enthusiastic about this technique. I'm quite sure that um, that, that it will work well, that it will, the thing about this um, idea, this method is that it uses innocuous materials. I mean, it just mm. takes seawater and converts it into the small droplets. The, the water evaporates and it leaves the salt crystals. And uh, because of the turbulence of the marine boundary layer, the first one, one and a half kilometers, those salt crystals are carried up throughout the boundary layer and they act as cloud condensation nuclei, making very small droplets for the clouds and making the clouds highly reflective. The physics is known well, you know, how many droplets do you need in order to increase the reflectivity of a cloud? And Stephen has calculated and worked out that if you double the number density of uh, cloud condensation nuclei, you increase the reflectivity something like five to 6%. And we would only need, um, we'd need much less than that to, to do the effects. And depending on where we put the ships, we can achieve certain things. For example, saving a coral reef, cooling the ocean water in the Gulf of Mexico so that the hurricanes are less severe, um, cooling overall, cooling the water going up to the Arctic so that the Arctic uh, starts to cool. The, we can turn this thing off and on easily. You know, it's very scalable. Um, we just add more ships if we need more effect. Um, it's very low cost, um, as uh, as P as P both Peter and Stephen has been saying. It's been well simulated. Um, there's been computer models that show with how much with this how much spraying you do. Um, you know the effects that would occur. And um, one point it does indirectly remove some CO2 from the atmosphere because it cools the oceans. And if you cool the oceans a few degrees, um, the o cooler water absorbs more CO2. So the, 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 the balance of CO2 between the atmosphere and oceans will change with, if the oceans were cooled on a large scale, more CO2 would go into the oceans. Now this wouldn't help the ocean acidification problem, but it would reduce CO2 in the atmosphere and, and really help the uh, climate uh, change problem. Um, so other, uh, let me, let me yeah, go back to what you're saying there, Paul. It will reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere? Well, the, well, the CO2 is in equilibrium between the atmosphere and oceans. There's a dynamic uh, exchange of CO2. So if, you know, as we, our, our emissions increase, you know, as we put more and more CO2, you know, 40 gigatons of CO2, which is, you know, over 10 gigatons of carbon, 
you know, as we increase our emissions in the atmosphere, the ocean is one of the biggest sinks of the CO2. The CO2 goes into the oceans. More of it will go into the oceans if the oceans are cooler because the um, solubility for gases in water um, increases as the temperature is cooled. This is the opposite to dissolving solids in the ocean. So a warmer ocean will dissolve more salt um, and minerals, et cetera, but it dissolves less gases, CO2, oxygen, any, any gases. It's just a physical principle of, of liquids versus gases. So what I'm saying is that with the, this method cools the ocean, which is the key thing, and a nice side effect is that cooler oceans can absorb more gases, including CO2. So the balance of CO2 between the atmosphere and oceans changes with more being in the oceans and less being in the atmosphere with a cooler ocean. This is one of the problems with climate change, right? We're warming all of the oceans, so their ability as a sink of carbon decreases. It's also uh, possible that we will be able to stop the ice in the Arctic melting. And if you do that, you'll stop the, uh, the, all the methane in the seabed from coming up. And methane is a really much more uh, aggressive greenhouse gas than CO2. Uh, and if we, kept, if we prevent that methane burst, that would be a, a very important uh, thing to be able to do. <laughs> it, it's, um, it, methane is doing about a third of the, the warming that CO2 is at the moment, but it could be a lot more. It could overtake CO2. Yeah, so, uh, so, yeah. so Stevens worked out how many ships would be required and where you would need to put them in order to cool the ocean currents going up into the Arctic. And a lot of heat is transferred from the equator to the poles by the oceans and the atmosphere. Two thirds by the atmosphere, one third by the oceans roughly. And these ships placed um, you know, in Northern regions where the warm Gulf Stream was coming up, uh, you know, could actually significantly cool that. And also on the Pacific side, a lot of heat goes into the Arctic through the Fram, through the nearest, uh, the, the, the um, Bering Strait, get the right strait. And uh, that water could be cooled before it goes into the Arctic, and that would allow, give the ice a chance to have some recovery, right? Because yeah. that's a huge deal. We're going to lose the Arctic sea ice completely, you know, in one summer. I call it the um, blue ocean effect uh, event. And then, um, there, you know, we need the ice in the Arctic to for the Arctic to stay cool. If we have no sea ice floating in the Arctic, then all the heat energy goes into heating the water instead of into melting ice. And it takes a lot more energy to melt ice than it does to heat water. By a fact, a, a, a ratio of about 70 or 80. So this is a hugely significant effect. So it's imperative that we, if we have any capability of doing so, it's imperative that we mm. prevent the blue ocean event, or at least, um, you know, stop it from getting worse and, and uh, eventually reduce it over time by cooling the Arctic. Peter, you've been working on this a lot, uh, the, the methane release, which is terrifying from the Arctic. If that could be prevented, if the permafrost could be uh, kept intact, um, this would be critical to not releasing all that methane into our atmosphere. Um, yes, well, um, as, as uh, Paul said, it, it is a, the, the use of marine carbonating is a way of cooling the Arctic, maybe cooling it to the point where you can increase the area of sea ice. And it's hard to think of another method that will work. Um, there's, there's been lots of, of fanciful techniques proposed, none of them which have been proposed to scale, which involve use of pumps and pumping ice and pumping water, uh, windmills and so on, just kind of fanciful stuff. But reality is um, something like marine cloud brightening, and there isn't anything else like it that can do that job. And um, uh, it was about nine years ago, I think, um, uh, Stephen and uh, Alan Gadgen and John Latham and, and I did a modelling study on 
on where you should put your your ships in order to achieve maximum cooling of the Arctic. And and uh, the models did show uh, significant advances of the ice age in both at, at any time of year. Uh, so it, and I'm sure better modeling has been done since then. So I, I think that's that's probably one of the most important points about the use of mean cloud brightening, that it's a way of, of helping to bring back Arctic ice, or at least preventing it from going away some more. So the main places to put this would be in the Arctic and over the coral reefs. Those are the two things we want to protect the most. Is that the case? Those are, those are a couple of, power, of strong candidates, yes. Mm -hmm. Stephen? We're losing us at the moment. Uh, we're losing ice from the Arctic at the moment at 25,000 tonnes a second, all right? And if we know the latent heat of ice, we can work out how many uh, joules that is. And it turns out that the amount of heat that you need to do is uh, 700 times the electrical generating capacity of the United States. 700 times. So <laughs> you, you need to have a really high leverage to do that. And the reason that we can do it is that the, any, the solar energy that's reflected by a cloud drop is many tens of millions of times more than the energy that you need to make the nucleus on which it's going to grow, which is why we've got this enormous energy gain. And uh, we could do it with about, uh, well, I think I would say less than 100 ships, which gives you an allowance for ones in the wrong place. But you can only do it for about two months in the year. Uh, for, at at midsummer, there's more energy going into the North Pole than into the equator because it's going in over 24 hours. Uh, but you can't do it at all in the winter and you wouldn't want to. Uh, so um, we would have them anywhere along the, um, the, the Gulf Stream or the North Atlantic Drift anytime that will, will do. But, but you get a bigger effect quicker if you're up fairly north but only for a short time. Okay, now let's talk about the money and whether this, how this can become a feasible. Where are the likely sources of funding of governments, uh, corporations? Um, it's for, affordable by some of very rich individuals. Uh, the only way I can see it giving a commercial return is if you had the governments of the, uh, the countries around the Gulf of Mexico that are affected by hurricanes uh, mm. could say to them, what's it worth to cool the sea surface around you to whatever temperature you want? No one's going to be brave enough to promise we won't, you'll never get any more Category 5 hurricanes because they know what it's like to be sued by Americans if you, if you don't do it. So what, they, what we could do is to say, this is what you said you wanted for the sea surface temperatures. We got this close to it, and therefore you owe so much. The, otherwise, doing it is going to benefit everybody in the world. Uh, very high winner to loser ratio. But you could, there's no way that they, they can be made to pay unless they're feeling very generous. And I don't think and all the countries would be very generous. Uh, so we have to do it by, some, by a temperature measurement rather than by uh, anything else. Uh, the insurance companies would be involved in this and also perhaps real estate people who will see the value of uh, attractive beach property going down if they, if nothing's done. So the, those are the uh, sorts of ones. Yes, I just want to point out that just today there's a, there's a lot of news stories about FEMA in the US and um, they're changing their, their policies and they're not going to be supporting the people that live on coastlines. So it's suddenly going to become extremely expensive for Americans to live on, on coastlines or low-lying areas and get any insurance whatsoever. And uh, so there'd be huge interest if there was a way to, um, to reduce ocean temperatures and reduce the severity and, and, and uh, frequency, et cetera, of these massive um, hurricanes that have been hitting the coastline. So there's loads of, you know, um, there, 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 there's loads of money that could go towards this. And any of these billionaires, I mean, how much are they spending on, is Elon Musk spending on SpaceX and Jeff Bezos 
and uh, Richard Branson, any of those guys uh, could direct a small fraction of their money and this could be up and running in no time. It's not, it's not rocket science. Marine cloud brightening is not rocket science. And they're doing rocket science and, and funding the, the, the bills. So, in, and, I, you know, if you look at the number of billionaires on the planet now, I don't know if it's in the thousands or how many there are, but any of them would have the ability to get this thing up and running. They just need to be convinced of the merits. And I would say it's a lot easier to convince uh, one person on the merits of this project rather than uh, the whole bureaucracy of any government. So... Well, I think that might be. Sorry, on that, um, maybe Stephen's comment. What, what, what is his view uh, of the likelihood of government funding for green cloud brightening in Britain? What's the state of play? What is At the, the moment, they, they say that it's got to be zero because they say there'll be winners and losers. Uh, my <laughs> estimate. The is human the race are the losers. <laughs> <laughs> I think the winner-loser ratio would be a lot higher than nearly every, any other government activity. Mm. Nothing they can do doesn't have some losers, uh, but I think the ratio would be very good. But at the moment, that's what they're saying. And I don't think uh, I have a very high regard for the, um, the, the technical decision maker. I think another question to ask is, uh, what's the research needed to m give you more accurate cost estimates? And that's really very low. For about about five, five to ten million dollars, we could answer all the questions about all the, the key bits of technology. We need to do quite a lot of modeling of the climate, um, which would tell us where and when we ought to be doing the, uh, the spraying, and also when we shouldn't be doing it, which is another uh, important question. But it's, it's, uh, it's cheaper. The thing to do is remember it's, it's cheaper than having a COP26. Um, yeah. People have objected to aerosols because they're afraid of what it would do to the climate. You were you were showing us, Stephen, uh, what goes into this, and I believe it's salt and um, some other. You had to, you were holding up. Yes. Um, well, the the amount of salt we're putting up is ridiculously small compared to the amount of salt that's going up already in a wide range of sizes, um, and. I can show you a slide which will tell you how much is going up now. There's a lot of different estimates, but well, well uh, Peter, why don't, or Stephen, why don't you hold up those two bottles? Because that's a perfect demonstration of the reflectivity of smaller particles. So explain yeah. what that is. Right. This is uh, four millimeter diameter glass balls, and that's 40 micron glass balls. You can see that the reflectivity of this is about uh, 0.6, and this is about 0.9. So, so six to so sixty reflectivity when the when the balls are four millimeters. So it's all the, the tiny particle is the one that that creates, and so creating the tiny particle is the essential aspect yeah. of this process. And yes. it also when, turns out the size that we want to have is where there's actually a, a, a drop in the the natural environment aerosol size. You'd have thought there'd be a fairly even distribution of size with 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 a concentration in the atmosphere, but that's not true. There's three different modes. There's the Aitken mode, the accumulation, and the coarse mode. And we want to be uh, between the, the Aitken and the accumulation mode, close to the accumulation mode. And uh, this, this is a, uh, a, a thing that seems to be giving you the very much better return for the effort you're putting in. Yes. Also, um, when you generate the very small um, droplets in the clouds, those clouds last a long time. They don't rain out the water, yeah. right? It, when you see a storm cloud coming, it's very dark because uh, you know it's very it's huge droplets, and they're about to fall. Um, you know, exceed the gravity, and the turbulence doesn't keep them up, and they just fall to the ground, and they collide with other droplets and get bigger, and so on. You get the rain, but when you make clouds with very, very tiny particles, not only are they highly reflective, but they last days, they can last a long time yeah. and do and reflect all that light away during during the days each time. They last half the mean time between rain showers. The only thing that gets rid of them is having rain or drizzle. So that's, that's it's, a, it's a few days um, uh, of a lifetime.
we know that at the North Pole in the summer, it's uh, daylight uh, all 24 hours a day, right? There's, there's months and months of, of just sunlight there, right? So if these um, clouds are being generated in, in the far north, then um, it's they're not they're going to be reflecting for you know twenty hours a day or something like they're going to have a huge impact on um, reflecting light away and cooling the Arctic. Whereas yeah. if you deploy them you know over a coral reef near the equator, it's only twelve hours of sunlight, twelve hours of darkness, right? So they're working half the time. So that's a key factor um, for for northern deployment at say the outskirts of of the ice sheets. <laughs> Yes, if you wanted to uh, reduce the severity of hurricanes, you'd have a, a, a fleet of them between Africa and the Caribbean. Um, and you'd start them working uh, in November and you'd watch the sea surface temperatures in all that sea area. And you'd compare it with the temperature patterns that the, the local residents are, uh, would like to have. And you'd increase or reduce the number of, uh, of vessels at work until the hurricane season came around in June, July of the, of the next year. And uh, if they're not being uh, needed for a hurricane, you could move them off to the coral or you could put them somewhere, perhaps in the Indian Ocean, which would adjust. Yeah, I was just gonna say also, um, think of a shipping crate uh, for a ship, right? Like if they were in containers and they could either go on the spray vessels or at some periods of the year, you just want to sit them on an island, for example. If you had to cool the water, you know, um, in a certain region for, you know, a week or a month at a time, you could just have one fixed in place. It would be generating clouds and the clouds would be carried by the air currents to, to the proper locations. And that would be even uh, cheaper um, to, um, to deploy. I'd like to do some tests from an island to begin with. Yes. somewhere where we've got clean air coming in and going out mm. and but we want to have it able to operate for several months so to cover a wide range of meteorological conditions they won't sometimes it won't want to, won't be able to work but we would we would gain a, a, all the information we wanted in let's say six months on this remote island i've got a design for a, a putting all the spray equipment into a sea container we could do it on the deck of a ship but the the, 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 the ship deck is the ship owner isn't going to want to stick around for three weeks just because we want to get more data. They, they want to get, get to their destination. So what would be the cost of doing um, just one um, device and then deploying it, you know, on an island? It, it's very, very inexpensive, right? I mean, if you that, had... That would be uh, probably... You, get, you'd have to do quite a lot of research to get the spray mechanism right. But I would guess that would be about $10 million to get your... An island experiment going get up uh, and running, right? Yeah, and you need to have people there for looking after it. I'm sure we could. <laughs> people who live on islands are actually very intelligent and very versatile, mm. and I'm sure we could train them up to look after the machine. Well, this is an extremely powerful and and, and uh, exciting idea, and I hope that somehow. Um, people can start working on funding this and that some of our insane millionaires can stop heading into space and start trying to save our planet instead. Um, I appreciate your all being here today. Uh, it was great to talk with you and thank you very much.